Well, good morning, church family. Hey, it's good to see y'all this morning. Happy Easter. Y'all look good in your Easter pastels this morning, I have to say. Uh, but it's so good to see you here in this place. Uh, if you are new here this morning, uh, my name is Corey, one of the pastors here. I just want to say a word of welcome to you. We're so grateful that you're here. And uh, you need to know that we are not a perfect church. This is a church uh, composed of sinners and broken people saved by the grace of God. And so we're just grateful to be here. That's why we gather. That is our aim and our direction here this morning to worship Jesus once again. Uh, we're going to start a little bit different than we normally do. Um, we've got a, a special song that we want to share with you. It's called blown away and the lyrics to this song are incredibly powerful but uh, I just want to we just want to give you an opportunity I think so often times in the Easter season it's just busy if we're honest and it's hard to get here to church it's hard to get your family dressed and ready to go and checked in the kids uh, department and get parked and all the things that you have to do it's it's kind of a rush to get here uh, but we wanted to give you an opportunity just to pause, to be still for a moment, to still our spirit just for a moment and reflect on the work of Christ, the, sacri the sacrifice that Christ made for us. And then we will turn our attention, of course, to the resurrection. Um, but we just wanted to give you an opportunity just to still your soul, still your spirit just for a moment. So I'm going to ask you to stay seated for this first song and um, sing along with the band as we reflect on these lyrics and the sacrifice of Jesus. Oh 
with us as we continue in worship this morning. We look back to the cross, but we also celebrate an empty grave today. And it's because of that hope that we sing and we lift our voices together. Would you join us as we do? Your blood, you 
church. Man, what a credible declaration of what we're here to do. I'm going to invite you to be seated. And uh, in the next few moments, we have an opportunity to celebrate something that is a symbol in baptism. And man, what an appropriate symbol for a day like today. Um, because as we baptize, what we're saying, first of all, is that baptism doesn't save us. But when we come to the baptismal waters, we're declaring something that we've experienced, something that's happened in our heart and in our soul, and we're proclaiming that to everyone else. But, but what we do is we say that we're buried with Christ. What that means is that upon the death of Jesus, for those that are in him, our sin was also buried. Our past, those places that we failed and, and done wrong, wiped clean, our record white as snow before God Almighty. And then we do another thing. We say that we are raised to walk in newness of life because at the resurrection of Jesus, we have a down payment of a future and a hope with him as he sits at the right hand of God the Father and he rules and reigns. The Bible says that for those that are in him, we also will rule and reign with him. And so an appropriate symbol, an incredible day to celebrate it. And I get a very special opportunity to baptize two dear brothers to me, guys that I've known uh, most of my life. And so I want to invite up Joey and his family and Jimmy Lenartz and his family, if you will.
Yeah, y'all come on, stand on up. Well, man, what a, what a special privilege. Um, Jimmy, you told me you weren't nervous before. How are you feeling right now in this moment? You still feeling solid? <laughs> okay, all right. Man, Jimmy is, is a dear friend, and, um, and man, he's been through a lot, and he's had a long journey. Um, but what I have seen recently is that God has totally revolutionized his life and his heart. Uh, just, I, I see it in the evidence of, man, your hunger for the word, the way you're endeavoring to lead your family. I know without a doubt that God's going to honor that. And so, Jimmy, just as you come for pr public profession before your church, I just want to ask you two questions. Number one, do you believe that Jesus Christ did everything necessary for your salvation? Yes. And number two, not only is he Savior, but is he Lord? Wherever he tells you to go, you're going to go. Whatever he tells you to do, you're going to do. Yes. Yes. Well, upon this profession of faith, man, it is my great privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ. Raised to walk. Come on in, bro. I've known Joey since middle school. And, and his story is similar to every one of our stories, um, that we've, we've wandered from the Lord. We, we didn't know the Lord, but Jesus didn't care. And we don't have to clean ourselves up before we come to him. God met you right where you were. And Joey, I, I've seen an incredible change in your heart, man. And I've known you for a long time. I've known all the different parts and pieces of your life and I can tell something supernatural has happened and I, I know without a doubt that Jesus has come in that his spirit dwells in you and you're a different man than you've been in the past and so I just want to ask you two questions in front of your church family number one do you believe that Jesus has done everything necessary for your salvation and then number two not just as he savior but do you make him Lord wherever he tells you to go you're going to go whatever he tells you to do you're going to do upon that profession it is my deepest pleasure to say and to baptize you in the name of the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit buried with Christ and raised to walk you can sit right here man let me, let me just pray and so, Lord, I, I just lift up my friends and my brothers to you. God, I just thank you for the miracle of your work and your salvation in our life. God, that you took three guys that didn't know you, that were far from you, and that you have redeemed us, and you have found us, and you're writing a new story than the, than the story that we wrote on our own. I, I thank you for this. God, I pray for their families. I pray for their marriages. Father, I, I pray that as they walk with you, God, that you would guard them from the schemes of the devil. We know that wherever you're moving, Satan is not far behind, and he wants to kill, steal, and destroy. And so, Lord, I pray that you would undergird them, that you would be their fortress and their shield, and that this would just be the beginning of, of a completely different story that you're writing across their lives. Lord, I, I thank you, and I worship you. Father, I pray that you open our eyes in this moment and open our ears to see and to hear your word. In Jesus' name, amen.
And so that church, that is the power of the resurrection. People from every walk, stage, and background, restored, redeemed, reborn, renewed in him. And what we understand is that Jesus is no longer in the grave, but he is alive. He is ruling. He is reigning. He's saving. And he's walking with those of us who are found in him. That's my story. That's many of your stories. And so we gather in this room to celebrate. And we celebrate with full hearts and souls that are just overwhelmed by the goodness of God to us through his son. You know, Easter is not just some Christian holiday. It is the center point of our faith. It's not simply something that happened in history, but it is a reality that we are experiencing in a personal walk and relationship with the very God who created the universe. And so the resurrection, it is our hope. It's our strength, it's our healing, our assurance, it's joy in every season and situation and circumstance that life brings. Because what we understand is that because he lives, whatever we face, whatever we lose in this life, we will gain it a hundredfold in the life to come with him. And so we gather in this place, and I just want to say from my heart to yours, Happy Easter. I'm so grateful that your families have come and that we've gathered in this place. We've got people packed out in the West Wing. We've got people online. But we get to gather today in celebration of who he is and in celebration of this incredible promise that we have received through him. If you will, turn with me in your Bible to John chapter 20. We're going to be in verses 24 through 30 today. We're going to use that as a launching point for for our discussion Uh, And and I just want to say this, as you turn there, there are certain things in life that we know to be true in our head, but we still find it hard to comprehend as they unfold. It's like I see it with my eyes, but it's hard for me to just really believe and to see it and to understand that it's happening. I don't know about you guys, but I was tuning into Netflix just the other day. And I was watching a documentary on a lady named Diana Nyad. Anybody familiar with her? She was a long-distance swimmer. But in her 60s, there was this one goal that she never met that was just sort of tugging at her. And that goal was that she had always wanted to swim from Cuba to Florida. 110 miles. Currents. Temperature. Jellyfish, storms, sharks, no shark net. And as I watched this documentary unfold, I watched her get into the water. I watched her one arm over the other. But still, as she landed on the beach of Florida, and as she walked up the sand, she looked like she had been swimming for 110 miles. But even though I had witnessed it, I could not in my mind grab a hold of what she had done. Maybe you've had that experience. Maybe it was an incredible tragedy. Maybe it was breathtaking scenery. Maybe it was the birth of a child. I remember my wife carrying all three of our children, and and all of a sudden you're watching this little baby bump, and and poof, you have a real-life human being in your arms. It's an amazing thing. And it's something that we all experience in this life as a part of our story. And clearly, even the most intelligent human beings are limited in their understanding and their perception of what is possible. I I love these quotes. Charles H. Duell, he was the director of the U.S. Patent Office in 1899, very confidently stated this. He said, everything that can be invented has been invented. That was 1899. Robert Milliken, a Nobel Prize winner of physics in 1923, he said this. He says, there is no likelihood man can ever tap the power of the atom. He was wrong. An investment banker to Henry Ford said this. He said, the horse is here to stay, but the automobile is only a novelty. How many of you own a horse right now? Anybody in the room? 
And so what we find is that uncertainty and doubt, they are often a, a very natural part of life. And this is not always a negative thing. I, I believe that sometimes it can be positive. Sometimes our doubt, our questions, our uncertainty, they drive us to ask questions, to test. And when handled correctly, I believe that our uncertainty can be a catalyst for discovery and development. And I believe that this is also true spiritually. You see, God often uses our doubt to drive us to question and to test and to learn, to dig and confirm the truth of who he is. And he uses it not to tear us down, but to build and strengthen our faith and our trust and our resolve in him. And so in that way, I believe that doubt often gets a bad rap. And since it's got such a negative connotation, often we, we feel shame when we feel doubt, especially spiritually. We are afraid people will mistake our uncertainty for unbelief. We fear that we might be misunderstood or even shunned for our questions. And so instead of addressing our doubt, often we run and we hide our doubt and we let it fester, causing more damage than it needed to in the first place. This is particularly true around the events of Easter. I want to say very clearly to you that our faith is unapologetically centered on something that is absolutely supernatural. At the very center of the Christian faith is something that is otherworldly. And so if you haven't had questions, if you haven't wrestled with these things, you're not reading the same passages in the Bible that I'm reading. These things are incredible. But that is why the account of one of the 12 disciples right after Jesus' crucifixion, is so refreshing and liberating to me, and I, I pray that it will prove so for you. And so let's pick up the story. In John chapter 20, we're going to jump right in the middle of it. Verse 24, I'm going to read it, and we'll use it as a launching point this morning. The text says this. It says, Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again. And Thomas was with them. And although the doors were locked, Jesus came and he stood among them. He said, peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, put your fingers here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And so here in this moment, we see the, the biblical account of Thomas. And, and I just want to give us some context for the story really quickly before we dive in, because we're sort of jumping into the middle of a whole thing here this morning. You see, at this point in Scripture, Jesus has been tragically and suddenly crucified in Jerusalem. And because of his death, what I want you to see is that that the disciples, their entire world, is absolutely turned upside down. They are completely disoriented. They were expecting a conquering king, a political figure that was going to relieve them of the Roman oppression that they were experiencing. And all of a sudden, as they're following Jesus, the crowds are there, but then it turns and he is dead. And you can imagine their hopes absolutely dashed. Everything that they knew turned upside down. They were in hiding. They were shell-shocked. They were scattered. They were shamed. They were despondent. The city of Jerusalem a holy city, 
had became incredibly hostile to these disciples. But all of a sudden, they begin to get reports that Jesus has been seen alive, that he is risen. And every single one of them expressed their doubts. It wasn't just Thomas. You would have too. They had seen Jesus raise other people. But could it be possible that he would raise from the dead? And then one by one, Jesus began to appear. First to Mary Magdalene. And then he appeared to a group of disciples in a room. And yet what we find in this passage is that as he appeared to those disciples, there was one disciple that wasn't there. It was Thomas. And so those disciples, they run, they find Thomas, they say, hey, Jesus is alive. We saw him. And then we see this response. It's very human, but yet very understandable. Thomas says, unless I see him, unless I put my finger in the nails of his hands and in his side, I will never believe. You ever been in a moment like that? Your heart's hurting. You just need proof. Thomas, Thomas was there. And so we see the biblical account, but what I want you to see next is the historical accusation. Because this moment became a very fateful moment for Thomas. You see, in history, Thomas was not known for his faith and his loyalty. Thomas was very quickly labeled for his doubt and his uncertainty. This expression of a doubt became a black eye for him. And now, all these years later, when you think of Thomas, you think of doubting Thomas. Not faithful or courageous Thomas. But here's the deal, church. I, I'm not sure that that negative reputation is fair or biblical or even helpful for us. Because when I look at the rest of Thomas's life, I see something very different. Thomas was more than a doubter. What we see in Scripture is that he was a chosen friend. Jesus Christ chose him to be one of his twelve. These were the men that would be the foundation of the first century church. Some of these men would write scripture. And I believe that as Jesus chose Thomas, he didn't make a mistake. He was God incarnate. And so Thomas was a chosen friend. Next we see that he was a loyal follower. While Thomas was a man of few words in scripture, when he did speak... He often displayed loyalty and courage. I think of the time that Lazarus was sick and then died and Jesus was going to go to him. And the disciples, they weren't so sure. You see, the last time that Jesus had gone to Jerusalem, he had almost been stoned. And so they weren't so sure that they wanted to do that and risk it. And yet we see Thomas, he pipes up. He says, let us go that we may die with him. Now, a little pessimistic and probably some sarcasm in there. But nonetheless, loyalty and courage. He's saying, look, guys, I don't know what you're sniveling about, but this is our Jesus. I'm with him to death. And so Thomas was a chosen friend. He was a loyal follower. But more than anything, Thomas was an honest questioner. You see, there's a difference between an honest questioner and a dishonest questioner. An honest questioner sincerely seeks to know the truth at all costs. But a dishonest questioner, they often use doubt to sidestep accountability and authority and to excuse their behavior. But when we look in Scripture, what we see is that Thomas, Thomas's questioning, it's honest. Thomas is a man that lives life with unhindered honesty. He wasn't worried about what anyone thought. He simply asked the questions that everybody was thinking, but everybody was also afraid to say. We saw it in John chapter 14. Jesus gives this beautiful speech. He says, let not your heart be troubled. I go to prepare a place for you, and where I go, you know the way. But it was Thomas that piped up, and he said, Lord, we do not know the way. Where are you going? How do we get there? You would have had the same question had we not had the rest of the story. 
Thomas simply just asked what everyone else was thinking. This isn't skepticism, but this is honest inquiry. And so church, what I want to say today is that while I'm not trying to place doubt on a pedestal, I also want to acknowledge the reality and the necessity of an honest and sincere search for truth. Thomas had questions, but I believe that he was honestly searching for the answers to those questions. And what we're going to find is that that's not something that Jesus condemns. It's something that he responds to. You see, the truth is, we all face doubts in life, and we all face doubts spiritually. There's intellectual doubts where we're searching for reason and logic and explanation so that we can believe. There's spiritual doubts where we're struggling with the guilt and the shame of our past. We're wondering if God can really forgive us and pardon us. There's circumstantial doubt where we ask questions like, how can a good God allow such bad things to happen on planet Earth? And in the same way, Thomas faced doubts. He needed more proof. And so we see, he says, unless I see him, I will never believe. Now, I'm not saying that that was the perfect response. He usually didn't have perfect responses. But you can understand where he's coming from. Hurt, disappointment, bewilderment. Thomas wasn't going to be so quick to give his heart away this time. We've all been there. Maybe today as you come into this room, this is your story. Maybe you've had your trust betrayed or misled by someone that was close to you. Everything that you thought you knew just turned upside down. Perhaps you faced the disappointment of religion or Christians or Christian leaders that you've known. Maybe you felt the shame of rejection or judgment within the church. Or perhaps you've witnessed sinful attitudes and actions by People that call themselves followers of Jesus. And so as a result, you've sort of pulled back. You're guarded. Maybe today you've rejected the whole thing altogether. Maybe you're new to the faith. And you love Jesus. You love his teachings. But as you approach the profound claims of Easter Sunday, while others are rejoicing, honestly, you just you have questions. What I want you to see is that Jesus doesn't condemn Thomas. He meets him right in the thick of his doubt and his uncertainty. And so we've seen this accusation in history. But the next thing that I want you to see is the affirmation of Jesus. Let's read it again in verse 27. It says, then he said to Thomas, this is Jesus, put your fingers here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. While the world chastised Thomas, what I want you to see is that Jesus, he did not. Jesus met Thomas in the midst of his doubt. And yeah, Jesus' response was intentional. He addressed Thomas directly, but it was not a rebuke. It was a gracious act of restoration and reaffirmation. Jesus was revealing himself again to Thomas in a way that would answer the deepest questions of Thomas's heart. And I believe that when we seek honestly, Jesus does the same thing to you and to me. And so what can we take away from this incredible story of Thomas and Jesus? When I have doubts, can I expect for Jesus to show up like visibly and let me test him out? Probably not. But I do believe that when we seek him, Jesus will meet us there and he will demonstrate his goodness and his presence to us. And so the first thing that I want us to take away today is this. Number one, God, God can use our doubts and our uncertainty. And he can use it to drive spiritual growth and development. Our doubt and our uncertainty, it doesn't have to be a negative thing. It can be a good thing. And let me tell you something. Jesus, Jesus is big enough for all of your questions. He is not intimidated by your doubt. What he understands is that his person, his work, His word, they can all stand up against the closest of scrutiny and they have over the centuries. Doubt doesn't have to drive you away. 
But when we bring our doubt to Jesus, it can actually draw us closer. I love the way that Ray Pritchard says this. He says, Thomas was not an unbelieving skeptic. He was a wounded believer. It helps me to think of doubt as a kind of immunization. When you receive a vaccine, you actually get a tiny bit of exposure to a disease, even a life-threatening one. But this activates antibodies so that you have the ability to fight that disease and remain healthy. In the same way, doubts can actually end up developing a much stronger faith if we face our doubts honestly. The Bible backs this up. Isaiah 1, it says, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Jesus quotes the Old Testament in Matthew, and he says, And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your what? Your mind. And so God is not put off by your questions. Skip Heidzik says it this way. He says, Understand your doubts don't intimidate God. The all-powerful risen Christ can handle anything our inquiring or doubting minds can conjure up. That in itself is liberating. Have you ever had troubling questions about God? Have you ever felt that such doubts just weren't welcomed by other Christians? Then take heart from the story of Thomas. I'll bet that those other disciples gave Thomas a few strange looks as well. But Jesus did not. He knew knew what Thomas was after. And he was there to help him get back to the place of strong faith. Now, admittedly, this can go the other way. Our doubt can turn into things that are harmful. We live in an age of skepticism and deconstructionism. And people, rather than honestly seeking truth, they are often dishonestly destroying anything that challenges their thoughts and perceptions and desires. And this is not honest questioning, and this is not honest God, but sincere seekers need not be too ashamed of spiritual questions. Because at the feet of Jesus, our questions can be a launching pad for spiritual growth and spiritual truth. And this is especially true when it comes to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, the resurrection is not a minor doctrine. You can't be a Christian and not hold fully the resurrection of the Savior. I love the way that Pastor Adrian Rogers says it. He says the resurrection is not merely important to the historic Christian faith. Without it, there would be no Christianity. It is the singular doctrine that elevates Christianity above all other world religions. And so when we approach the resurrection, we we often have questions, but what I want to tell you today is that God knew you would have those questions, and He has left us plenty of historical evidence. You know, so many people, when it comes to the Bible, they want absolute 100% certainty. But the truth of the matter is, is that's an unfair expectation of any historical document. A historical document isn't tested. Any historical document is not tested empirically through the scientific method. All of history is tested through a different method called the historical critical method. And what that method does is not put Jesus in a test tube, but it takes the documentation through history and and it confirms if it's valid, if it's true, if it's close to the eyewitness testimony, if the eyewitness testimony was believable, believable and holds water historically. And what we find is that when we approach the New Testament and when we approach the Bible as a whole, it is a miracle of solid historical evidence. I want to remind you of the things that that validate our scriptures. Number one, it's the accuracy of the historical documents themselves. One commentator said this, he said, New Testament scholars have an embarrassment of riches compared to the data that the classical Greek and Latin scholars have to contend with. The average classical author's literary remains number no more than 20 copies. We have more than a thousand times the manuscript data for the New Testament than we do the average Greco-Roman author. Not only this, but the extant manuscripts of the average classical author are no earlier than 500 years after the time that it was written. 
But for the New Testament, it's merely decades. What is he saying? Well, because the New Testament has thousands and thousands of manuscripts, we can actually trace that documentation to within a decade of the eyewitness. In a historical critical method, that is a lock-solid case. So we can trace the documents. We can see all of the accidental blemishes, anything that might have changed. And what we know is that when we come to this scripture, historically, it is 99.99% the exact implementation of the eyewitness account. It's phenomenal. There's no other history book like it. And so there's the accuracy of our documents, but also there's the reality of the Old Testament prophecy. You see, the events of the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus, they were foretold hundreds of years before they occurred. 400 prophecies telling the events of Jesus' life in detail. Statistically impossible for one man to meet all of those qualifications. In fact, those prophecies are so detailed that that people who didn't love the Bible, they often would say, well, the disciples had to go back and they had to have edited a book like Isaiah to fit the Jesus account. That sounded believable for a little while, but then we found the Dead Sea Scrolls. And that backed our earliest manuscripts up hundreds and hundreds of years before they ever said that that would be possible. And so it's not just the accuracy of our documents is the reality of Old Testament prophecies. It's also the testimony of eyewitnesses. In history, in order for a document to be valid, it needed eyewitness documentation. And what we find is that in, that, in, in the documents, in all of that trail of copies, we see that the resurrection of Jesus was witnessed by over 500 people. Some of them were his disciples, But there were many others who were antagonistic to his ministry, but all of them give the same story. Jesus seen alive, resurrected. Last but not least, there's the activity of the disciples. I think Erling C. Olson says it really well. He says, whoever reads the New Testament seriously or gives thought to the impact which the apostles made upon their generation, must acknowledge that one outstanding historic event alone spurred that small band of 11 ordinary men to an amazing task of evangelism in their generation. Defying every obstacle, loss of home, persecution, even death itself, they evidenced the supreme relevance in their ministry of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Christ. Is their eyewitness testimony believable? Well, you have a group of them. They're huddled together, scared to death, powerless. Something happens. All of a sudden, they emerge bold, even to death. God has left us with an incredible amount of rich fact for our doubting minds. And yet, while God has richly provided fact, what I want to remind you of is that believing in him will always require faith. The Bible echoes this. Hebrews 11.6, it says, And without faith, it is impossible to please him. God has left so much fact, but there will always be a gap. There must always be a leap. And it's by faith. So many people don't like that, but the truth of the matter is is that we all live by faith in our life. We live by faith nearly every day. I can promise you when you step on an elevator, you're stepping on that elevator by faith. You're trusting that it's in good working order, that it's not going to malfunction and you're going to fall. When you take a pill, you're trusting that that pill in the factory wasn't tainted. And when you take it, it's going to do the job that you intend for it to do and not kill you on the spot. Our whole lives have measures of faith. And following Jesus is no different. So I want you to see, God can use our doubt. He can use our doubt to strengthen our faith. But the second thing that I want you to see this morning is that doubt unaddressed can be very dangerous. Doubt that festers, can be spiritually deadly. There are plenty of willful skeptics in our world today. 
people who aren't really seeking truth, but they're using their doubts and their questions as a smokescreen to hide and habituate agendas and sin. This is different than honest doubt. This is unbelief. And while we may think that doubt is the opposite of faith, it is not, but willful unbelief is. And we've got to be very careful that we don't allow our doubt to linger and to fester in a way that it becomes unbelief in our heart. When I look at this account of Thomas, what I, I would say is that Thomas walks a very thin line here. He, he's in pretty dangerous territory. While his doubt shouldn't condemn him, he was certainly vulnerable. The Bible tells us that Satan is like a roaring lion, that he's seeking to devour us. And what we know is that Thomas, Thomas was playing with some things that, that he could have not ever returned from. And so how do we prevent doubt? How do we prevent our doubt from becoming dangerous? Number one, we need to make sure that we avoid isolationism. That we avoid being isolated. Now, truthfully, this is a natural human response to getting hurt, isn't it? When we get hurt, usually we, we get away from whatever it is that hurt us. We, we sort of get off to ourself and sulk. We're confused. We sort of hide away and stay away. And we see that this is exactly what Thomas did. Thomas was not there with the rest of the disciples when Jesus appeared the first time. Why? Well, he had isolated himself. He was hurt. He was confused. And so he moved himself away from the group. And in that, he missed the resurrected Jesus. I told you that the Bible says that Satan is like a roaring lion. What does a lion do? Well, he sits in the grass. He waits for a member of the herd to get separated. And then he goes in for the kill. And we've got to be very careful. That we don't isolate ourselves from the people of God and the community of God. Because what we know is that we need, we need the safety and the encouragement of Christian community as we wrestle with our faith. And so we need to avoid isolationism. The second thing that we need to do is we need to abstain from dogmatism. I don't know if you notice it, but Thomas is incredibly dogmatic. He says, unless Jesus does X, Y, and Z, I will not believe. Those are dangerous words. We've got to be very careful that we don't lay out a gauntlet of things that God has to do, that he's got to jump through hoops to please us. Let me tell you something. God doesn't owe us anything. And, and he is not subject to our will and our whims. And so we've got to be careful that we're not dogmatic. But it also, doesn't it also just discount everything that he's done when we do that? We say, God, I want you to do X, Y, and Z, and then I'll believe. But, but what about the fact that he has preserved this word miraculously over thousands of years in many different authors? What about the fact that Jesus stepped out of paradise and he submitted himself to death on the cross for you and for me. Isn't that enough? And we've got to be sure that we're not dogmatic and in our dogmatism that we discount what he's done. He has done much. It has been at great cost to him. And so we've got to abstain from dogmatism finally. We've got to steer clear of staunch skepticism. What I mean is willful unbelief. We see Thomas walk this line. In the passage, verse 25, he says, I will never believe. Now in the Greek, this is a double negative. And while in English that's bad grammar, in Greek it is not. In fact, a double negative in Greek is used for emphasis. And so what I want you to see is that Thomas is doubling down here. In, in effect, he is saying, I will not not believe I will never not believe he doesn't say I cannot that would have been open kind of like the father that goes to Jesus and he says Jesus I want to believe help my unbelief but what we see is that Thomas Thomas is flirting he's flirting with a hard heart 
And if it wasn't for Jesus' intervention, we don't know where Thomas would have ended up. Church, if you allow yourself to stay in that space of skepticism for too long, you can unintentionally turn from an honest questioner to a dishonest doubter. And so we've got to be very careful that we don't put God in a box. Because while God can use our doubt, our doubt unchecked can become very dangerous to us spiritually. But what we find is that Thomas does something that's very important. While he has questions, while he has uncertainty, while he has doubt, he does something that changed the trajectory of his life. He submitted and surrendered that doubt and those questions to Jesus. And that brings up the very final thing that I want to say today. Surrendered doubt leads us to a demonstration and a declaration of the risen Savior. The thing that Thomas did was he didn't hold his doubt too long and make it fester. He brought it to Jesus. And Jesus met him right in that moment. And he healed and he restored and he brought strength back to Thomas's faith. And I believe with all of my heart that that's what he is willing to do to us. Look at what Thomas says. Jesus shows up, meets him right there in the middle of his questioning. And all of a sudden we see Thomas say this. He says, my Lord and my God. That's very specific. That's very definitive. There's no doubt left in Thomas. He's very clear. A demonstration of Jesus led to this incredible declaration from Thomas. And what we find is that that changed the trajectory of Thomas' life. History tells us that Thomas was the greatest missionary out of all 12 disciples. Have you ever wondered why we don't hear a lot from Thomas in the rest of the New Testament? It's because Thomas took the gospel into Syria in Iraq, in Iran, and ended up into India where he was martyred for preaching the resurrected Jesus. That was not doubt. That was certainty. And the way that he gained that certainty was that he brought his questions and his doubt to the feet of Jesus. That's my story. When I was a young man, I grew up in a Christian household. But when I hit middle school and high school, I took a hard left. I started experimenting and living and doing whatever I wanted to do. And when I arrived on the college campus my freshman year, I had just got back from a party, and I just felt absolutely empty. I knew that I was not walking in accordance with the faith that I had been given as a kid. And so I I literally took a walk. And I was talking out loud. Someone would have seen me. They would have thought I was nuts. And I said, Lord, I I feel so far away from you. I've done everything my own way. You've given me everything that I wanted. And I am so lost. I, I don't even know if you are real anymore. And I can promise you that in that moment, as I sought the Lord, Jesus met me on that college campus. It wasn't visible, but it was in a way that I was certain And he answered the deepest questions of my heart. And my life has never been the same since. If we'll take our doubt to Jesus, he will meet us in our doubt. And he will deliver us. And he will change our declaration. We will see a demonstration of who he is. And it will change the trajectory of all that we are and we we become. If that's you today, my prayer is that you would test me on this. Jesus is big enough for any question or concern that you have. You just got to bring it to him. Let's pray. And so, Father, Lord, we rejoice in this very real and human account of one of your disciples. And Lord, I just thank you that you included it in this book. You didn't have to do that. But God, it speaks to me. I'm wired like Thomas. 
often I have questions and I'm looking for proof and assurance. And God, that isn't something that you condemn, but it's something that you meet us in the middle of. And so, Lord, I I just pray that if there's anybody in this room who doesn't know you, I pray that if there's anybody in this room that's listening to the sound of my voice and they realize that their doubt has led them away from Jesus, not to him, I pray that today would be a new day. I pray that this could be a day of salvation for them because, God, your promise in Scripture is that if we seek you, we will find you. And that we don't have to clean ourselves up to come to you, that you will do that for us, but we're to come as we are, that we're to lay everything down, that we're to surrender it at your feet, and that, God, you will move in, that you will reveal yourself, you will restore, and you will redeem it. And so, Lord, if there is someone in this room that does not know you, I pray that today they would not leave this room without bowing the knee to you, surrendering to you as Lord and Savior and inviting you into their life and in their heart so that you can begin your restorative work. God, you you have a new path, a new future for us. And, Lord, I pray that we would walk in it. God, let Thomas be an encouragement to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to invite you to stand. And as our band comes to sing one final song, I want to invite you to respond to the Lord. This is not just sort of one of the things that we do to end our service. I believe that this is a God-ordained moment. I believe that you are not here by accident. I believe that God has called you He has brought you here to this service for this particular message. And so as we sing, I want to encourage you to do business with God. We're going to have men and women down front. They're there for you. If you need prayer, we would love nothing more than to pray over you. If there are people in the room that need to be baptized or want to join this church, come out in the aisles as we sing. We we can get that process started. But there may be some people in this room that simply need to just begin to surrender some things to Jesus. We'd be happy to do that with you. but, But if you don't want someone to pray, you can come. We designate this as an altar. You can come and kneel. Pray on your own. But do not leave this place without doing business with him. If you're feeling oppressed on your heart and in your soul to surrender your life to Jesus for the very first time, don't delay. Don't allow Satan to destroy and to kill and to steal what Jesus has spoken in your heart. So in all this, we're going to sing. I pray that you would worship and that you would respond together with us.
Amen, church. Amen. Thank you all so much for being here. Yeah, you can clap. It's been a great Sunday. Baptisms, we did it all. Uh, thank you so much for being here. And if you're new here today, we don't want your journey uh, to end today. There's a host of things happening in the life and the ministry of this church. We've got a new sermon series on Jesus that's about to ramp up in a couple weeks. We've got a worship night that's happening. We've got vacation Bible school that's happening this summer. And we want you to be a part of all of those things. On the back of the seats in front of you, there is a QR code. If you want to scan that with your phone, you can find out everything that's happening in the life and the ministry of this church. And we so want you to be a part of those things. Last thing, and men, you're going to hate me for this, but today is a great day for a family picture. So I know, I know, long lines, holding kids, I know. But uh, we've got two picture walls on each side of the campus. Or if you want to hop outside and take one in front of some of the green trees, uh, feel free to do that. Those are for you. Y'all have a great Sunday and happy Easter. We'll see you next Sunday.